Welcome. We are live from the Institut Francais in London. I am Raphael Rodokanaki, cultural attaché to the French Embassy in the UK. And I am Lynn Surfetti, managing director for Mont Blanc in the UK. We are thrilled to partner up with Mont Blanc and the Antoine de Saint-Exupéry Foundation for Youth. As we host our first series of live readings of The Little Prince by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Translated by acclaimed author and playwright Michael Morpurgo. As 2020 marks the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. And the 120th anniversary of the birth of Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Michael Morpurgo will read his translation of this timeless tale each day this week alongside a new personality, including Kristen Scott Thomas, Ben Okri, Jade Anuka, Bruce Wilson, Tom Burke, and the great nephew of Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, Olivier Daguet. Original illustrations by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry will be presented, as well as live drawings by innovative calligrapher Alice Mazzilli, inspired by the readings. We are thrilled to welcome award-winning TV and radio broadcaster and host of Penguin's podcast, Nihal Arthanayake, who will moderate the series. Exclusively today, His Grace, the Duke of Wellington, we launch the first episode before we welcome Michael Morpugo and Christine Scott Thomas. For episode one of this exceptional series, today, June 29th, marks the very first International Little Prince Day. Join us every day this week from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. as we will be presenting a new episode of the world-renowned story with a new guest. Ask your questions on the live feed as each episode will end with a Q&A from the audience. Share, tweet, talk about this great event with your networks and friends. Nihal, we leave it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Rafael. Hello to everybody who is now logged in, whether you'll be on Instagram Live or whether you'll be on Facebook. Thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening. Now, let us begin by having some words from His Grace, the Duke of Wellington. Good afternoon. I often say that the long alliance between Britain and France began on the day after the Battle of Waterloo. My ancestor, the first Duke of Wellington, had a great affinity with France. As a young man, he attended the military academy at Angers. In later life, he was the British ambassador in Paris and subsequently lived in France for over three years. The present British embassy in Paris was acquired by the first Duke from Pauline Borghese, the sister of Napoleon Bonaparte. And at Apsley House, one of the best known images is a monumental statue of Napoleon by the Italian sculptor Canova. I'm speaking to you from Stratfield Say, the house and estate which was given to the first Duke by Parliament. We have here many of the objects which were bought in France by the first Duke. I've had in my life many reasons to travel to France and I served on the board of two large French companies for many years. I made myself a benefactor of the Louvre so that whenever I had a spare moment, I could visit the museum without having to queue. I tell you all this simply to demonstrate my appreciation of French heritage, arts, and culture. It is particularly appropriate that today we are going to hear readings from The Little Prince, a, a classic story written by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry with a recent new translator, translation by Sir Michael Mulpergo. It is a book familiar to millions of people in France, in the United Kingdom, and around the world. A film was made a few years ago of War Horse, another of Michael Mulpergo's books. The director was Steven Spielberg, and much of it was filmed here in the park at Stratfield Say. And as a family, we've always regretted that when Michael Morpurgo came to visit the set, we had already left for Scotland. Today, we celebrate Anglo-French cultural and historical ties. And like everyone, I look forward to listening to the readings of this outstandingly popular book. Well, Grace, thank you very much. Um, can, can I just start by asking you um, about your own relationship with this book, The Little Prince? Well, mine is, is 
not that close, other than like many, many parents. I read it to my children 40 years ago, uh, and I remember the pleasure it gave to them and to me, and uh, they must be typical of many, many children of that generation who had the book read to them. Do you remember how they reacted to the book? Because there are so many layers to this book, as Michael points out in his translation. Uh, are, are there not? I just remember the wonder they had about imagining all these different ideas that come out of the book. It's a, it's a magnificent tale, not just for children, but for adults as well. Thank you, Grace. Kristen Scott Thomas is here. Hello, Kristen. Hello. How are you? I'm very well. Cold, cold. It's July and it's, it's June, then it's supposed to be lovely and warm, and it isn't. It's freezing, but happy. Where would you be if you weren't doing this? And we're very grateful, by the way, that you are doing this. But for so many people in your uh, industry, of course, there were film sets, there were theatre stages to be on, and currently they can't be on any of those. Yes. Well, I would be filming. Um, I would be filming in a studio in 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 England. Yeah. Wow. But we're very grateful you're here with us. So that's yeah, I'm very happy to be here. That your diary allowed for that. Um, what about your own relationship with this book, Le Petit France, The Little Prince? Well, I spent a lot of time um, living in France, um, and I've been. Um, you know, since I was about 18, and I was an au pair girl, and I discovered this this, this book as an au pair girl uh, and, and reading it to the children I was looking after um, and then read it to my own children, but never really sort of read it myself. You know, I was reading it to other people as sort of um, this strange French object that is so unlike any of our English children's books. Um, very... Uh, Lots of very strange, seemingly unrelated ideas in there. Um, and very kind of, um, you know, it isn't a story with a baddie and a, and, a, and a princess at the end or a magic dragon or anything. It's all sorts of, it, he, he really plays with ideas. And, and, um, and I think that that, that that is what is interesting uh, to go back to and, and look again and to look at it in English in this beautiful translation um, to, to see how it, how it, uh, how it connects with me now as an adult. Well, Michael, thank you, firstly, for doing the translation and then giving us so much of your time this week. Uh, I also want to point out that um, Alice Mazzili is here, an expert in calligraphy. Hi, Alice. And uh, you're going to see her beautiful, beautiful work throughout when you're listening to the readings that you're about to read. Now, there are so many questions, Michael, I could uh, ask you, but I, I'd rather we get into you reading the foreword because you answer so many of those questions in the beautifully written foreword that you wrote in 2018 um, as to why you wish to translate this book. Now, for those people who are watching, uh, as I said, on Facebook or Instagram Live, what's going to happen is, is Michael's going to read uh, the foreword and then uh, Kristen is going to read um, chapters uh, one and three. She's doing the heavy lifting on the chapters, isn't she, Michael? And you're going to uh, read chapter two. Uh, and before that, um, Kristen is going to read something else in the book just after the foreword. So, Michael, without any further ado, please, would you read the foreword for your translation of The Little Prince? I wondered, as I was translating Antoine de Saint-Exupéry's glorious book, whether there is any book in the English language that is as familiar to so many of us, as universally beloved, as frequently studied, as deeply revered as The Little Prince is to the French. Unquestionably, we have many great and iconic books written in the English language that are widely read and loved and admired. But I can think of no single book of ours that appeals so widely across the generations, that remains so relevant, whose glow does not fade with the passing of time, that belongs as uniquely and particularly to the intellect and culture of its, courage, its country of origin. My conclusion as I was working on this, as I tried to write in his voice, live inside the landscape of his imagination, 
to tell it as he heard it and saw it and meant it, but in my way and in English, is that it might be possible to understand France and the French properly, unless you have read and known and loved this book. Certainly I've discovered in translating it that the best way to come to know a book intimately is to come to know the mind of the writer. I understand and appreciate more fully now the mastery of Saint-Exupéry's art and craft, the inspired brushstrokes of his storytelling. Translating this was a masterclass for me. Some will not be surprised to know after reading my translation of The Little Prince that this was my first attempt at any kind of translation. Probably since trying to translate pages of Racine's Phèdre when I studied French at school. I was no scholar then when it came to French language or literature and I am no scholar now. I am, however, a maker of stories, a teller of tales. I've lived and breathed stories since I was a child. So to be asked to translate one of the greatest stories ever written was an honor I could not refuse. And if I'm honest, I thought my knowledge of French would be just about up to it. Well, I was wrong about that. The economy of Saint-Exupéry's elegant yet complex prose, or is it poetry, proved to be a real challenge to my rather limited and literal understanding of French. I knew, of course, that I could crib off the established translations, but I also knew I must not, that I should not even take a peaky look at them, but rather translate as best I could, tell it down from Exupéry's French, my way, into my English, and then perhaps if I really needed to have a peaky look later, so that's what I did. I also wanted to do this translation because I knew that so many English speaking people have not had the joy of reading The Little Prince. It is a different book, unlike any other, strange, French. And in translation, the language can be inhibiting. Compared to the book's immense popularity amongst French readers, it seems to resonate much less with us. There might be many reasons for this. Broadly speaking, and especially in children's books, we seem to like stories that are above all exciting. As children, we love adventures that make us long to discover what happens next with characters with whom we can identify strongly. Now, the little prince has all that, but it is much more the story of a relationship, a story that asks the questions, the great questions of life and death of the human predicament. It is deeply intellectual and philosophical and therefore deeply troubling. And it is not a book that can be conveniently pigeonholed. Is it a children's book? Well, I suppose that depends on the grown up reading it. The Little Prince does not have a high opinion of the capacity of grown ups to understand the world of the child. Sadly, far too many of them have put away childish things. Anyway, I thought a new translation might enable us, children and grown up children, to discover this wonderful but different book. I hope it does. Great books can change us. Having immersed myself so completely in this story, I am sure I will never be able to look up at the stars again without thinking of the little prince up there somewhere. And I will look at a flower differently, at people differently, whether businessmen, lamplighters or kings. I will think of myself differently too, and try even harder to look after and cherish the child in me. For the child in each of us is the heart and soul in each of us. And I will be quite sure to check my engine before I set off my airplane on a flight over the desert. Good advice. Kristen, do you mind reading on? To Léon Vert. I want to apologize to all you children for having dedicated this book to a grown up. I have a proper reason. This grown up is my best friend in the whole world. And there's a second reason also. This grown up understands everything. 
even books for children. And there's a third reason. This grown-up lives in France, where he is hungry and cold. He really does need cheering up. But if all these reasons are not good enough, and they're not, then I should like to dedicate this book to the child that this grown-up once was. All grown-ups were once children, but very few of them seem to remember that. That's why I'm changing my dedication. To Léon Vert, when he was a little boy. Amazing. Now, Kristen, let's uh, start with chapter one, please, of The Little Prince. When I was six years old, I had a book on rainforests called True Stories from Wildlife. In it, there was an amazing drawing of a snake swallowing an animal whole. This is a copy done by me of that picture. Here's what it said in the book. Boa constrictors swallow their prey completely whole without chewing at all. Afterwards, they can't even move. And in order to digest what they've eaten, they have to sleep for a whole six months. I thought long and hard about all this and managed to draw a picture of the snake in colored pencils. It was my first ever drawing, my drawing number one, and it looked like this. I showed my masterpiece to some grown-ups and asked them if my drawing frightened them. They all said much the same thing. Why should a picture of a hat frighten us? But my drawing was not of a hat. It was of a boa constrictor who'd eaten an elephant. So I then drew a picture of how the insides of such a boa constrictor might look so that the grown-ups might understand. Grown-ups always need things explained to them. My drawing number two looked like this. The grown-ups told me I should not waste my time doing any more drawings of boa constrictors, whether of their insides or outsides, but in future concentrate more on geography or history or on mathematics or grammar. I was so upset at this response to my drawing number one and my drawing number two that I abandoned them at the age of six, that I abandoned then at the age of six any hopes I might have had of becoming a great painter. Grown-ups seem to understand nothing for themselves. It is very boring for children always to have expl to explain things to them. So since I should not be an artist, I had to choose another profession. I took up flying. I became an aeroplane pilot. I've flown just about all over the world. So it is true, my geography has been very useful. With just a glance, I can always recognize where I am. I can easily tell the difference between China and Arizona. And this is very helpful, I find, when I'm up there flying through the night and not at all sure of where I am. In my lifetime of flying around the world, I've met lots of interesting people. I've lived most of my life amongst grown-ups and had the chance to get to know them. I have to say this experience has not greatly improved my opinion of them. When I do meet one of these grown-ups who seems a little more enlightened, I make it my business to try out on them a little experiment. I show them my drawing number one and my drawing number two, which I have still kept until this time. I do this just to see how much they really understand. And always, without fail, they say, it's a hat. So I don't bother to talk to them about boa constrictors, nor rainforests, nor stars. I talk about what I know they're interested in, bridge, golf, politics, and ties. I know they're talking, they know they're talking to the right kind of person, and they're happy. Chapter two. So it was that I lived much of my life on my own, with almost no one to speak to. That is, until six years ago, when I was forced to crash land my plane in the Sahara Desert. Something had gone wrong with my engine. I had no mechanic with me and no passengers. I was alone. Somehow, I had to find some way of repairing my engine. It was a question of life or death. I had only enough water left for eight days. That first night, I lay down to sleep on the desert, knowing I was thousands of miles from the nearest living person. I was even more alone than a shipwrecked sailor lying on a raft in the middle of the wide, wide ocean. Imagine my surprise then, when I was woken at dawn 
by a strange, small voice. Excuse me, the voice said, but I was wondering if you could draw me a sheep, please. What? A sheep? I want you to draw me a sheep. I leapt to my feet as if I had been struck by lightning. I rubbed my eyes to be quite sure they were not deceiving me. No, I had seen what I had seen. An extraordinary looking little fellow was standing there, scrutinizing me intently. This is the best portrait I did of him a while later. But my drawing, it has to be said, is not nearly as good or as beautiful as he was in real life. That's not my fault though. If you remember when I was six, I had been rather put off following my intended career as a painter by discouraging grown-ups. After that sad experience, I had never really learned to draw anything else except boa constrictors, the insides and outsides of boa constrictors. So anyway, I stood there looking at this amazing and incongruous apparition, wide-eyed with wonder, as you can imagine. And you must not forget that I was thousands of miles from any human habitation. And yet this little fellow did not seem lost at all. He wasn't dying of exhaustion or hunger or thirst. And he did not look frightened in the least. He just did not look like a child lost in the middle of the desert, a thousand miles from anywhere. But, but what on earth are you doing here? I asked him when at last I had got over my surprise and found my voice. But he simply repeated his strange request very softly, very sweetly and in complete seriousness. Excuse me, but I was wondering if you could draw me a sheep, please. This whole situation, what he was asking me was so utterly absurd that somehow I, I could not say no. I knew that it was equally absurd, a thousand miles from anywhere and anyone, and in serious danger of dying out there in the desert to be taking a piece of paper and pen out of my pocket. I told this little fellow rather impatiently, I fear, that my studies had included geography, history, mathematics and grammar, but not drawing, that I really was not much good at drawing. That does not matter, he said. Don't worry about that. Just draw me a sheep. So, because I had never drawn a sheep, I did instead one of only two drawings that I knew I could do one of my best boa constrictor drawings, the one with the swallowed elephant inside. I was amazed at his reaction. No, no, he cried. I don't want a drawing of an elephant inside a boa constrictor. A boa constrictor is very dangerous. And for an elephant, it is huge and would always get in the way. At home where I come from, everything is small. I need a sheep. Draw me a sheep. So I drew him a sheep. He took one look at it, then he said, no, that's not no good at all. It looks already rather poorly to me. Do me another. So I did. My young friend smiled, but rather patronizingly, I thought. I'm afraid to have to tell you that this is not a sheep. It is a ram. It has horns. I did the drawing again, but he rejected it just as he had before. This one is too old. I want a sheep who will live for a long time by now. I had had enough of all this. I had no more time to waste. My engine needed stripping down. I had to get on with it. So very quickly, I sketched this drawing and showed it to him. There you are, I told him. This is his box. The sheep you want is inside it. I was, of course, expecting another rejection. So you can imagine my surprise when I saw that his eyes were bright with enthusiasm. That's just what I wanted. Do you think a sheep like this will need lots of grass? Why do you ask? Well, because as I told you, where I live, everything is rather small and there's not much room to grow a lot of grass. It'll be fine, I told the little fellow. I have drawn you a tiny, tiny little sheep. He leant forward and looked closely at the drawing now. Not so tiny as all that, he said. Would you believe it? The sheep? He's fallen asleep. And that was how I first got to know the little prince. Kristen. It took me a while to find out where he'd come from. 
little prince would ask me question after question, but whenever I asked him anything, he never seemed to hear me. It was only chance remarks he made that little by little I was able to discover anything at all about him. But his questions just kept coming. So, for instance, when he first set eyes on my aeroplane, and I shan't draw my aeroplane for you because it would be far too difficult, he immediately asked this question. What's that thing over there? It's not a thing, I told him. It flies. It's an aeroplane. It's my aeroplane. I said this because it was important to me that he understood that I flew it. That I was a pilot. I'm proud of it. What? He cried. You just fell out of the sky? I did. I replied modestly, not wanting to make too much of it. Oh, that's funny, he laughed. Really funny. The prince had a merry sort of laugh one that pealed like bells, and one which I have to say irritated me greatly. I mean, my plane had just crashed. I wanted my misfortune to be taken rather more seriously. Then he went on. So like me, you came down from up in the sky as well. Which planet are you from then? And that was when I began to understand something at last about where this mysterious little fellow might have come from. So you're from another planet too, are you? I asked him, but he didn't answer me. I saw he was shaking his head. He could not take his eyes off my aeroplane. I can't imagine, he said, that in that thing of yours over there, you could have traveled from very far away. He said no more for a while, but seemed to be lost in his own thoughts. Then he took my sheep out of his pocket. I could see it had become like a precious treasure to him. He simply gazed down at it in wonder for several minutes. You can imagine maybe how much I was intrigued by his strange reluctance to give me a straight answer as to which planet he came from. I had to try again to know more. Where do you come from, young fellow? I asked him. I mean, where's home? Where will you take your sheep to? There was a long and thoughtful silence. Then he said, What's really good about the box you've given me is that now it will be a place he can go to at night times, like a house for him. That's a good idea, I told him. And if you're good, I can give you some string as well and a post for you to tie him up to. But that idea really seemed to upset him. Tie him up? Why should I want to do that? What a strange idea. Because if you don't, I said, then he could wander off anywhere and get himself lost. Then came that peal of laughter again. But where do you think he would go? He asked. I don't know, wherever he feels like, straight ahead if he wants to. The little prince was suddenly serious. Well, that wouldn't be a very good idea. Everything is very small where I live. Then he added, rather sadly, so straight ahead wouldn't get him very far. Thank you, Michael. Thank you as well. Beautifully read. Beautifully <laughs> read. Um, Michael, um, we're going to get questions from the audience. So if you're still, uh, if you've just been entranced by Kristen and Michael's beautiful voices, uh, then you can get your questions to us now. Uh, if you are there on Facebook and Instagram Live, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, Michael, one thing that I found really interesting in your foreword is about how it's impossible for us to really understand France and the French without reading this. Can you expand on that more? Well, yes, I can. Really. I mean, France is the only other country I know really well. It's the only other language I speak. And I'm conscious of the fact when I go that I'm very English, um, that I'm pretty strange to them. <laughs> and they are quite strange to me. Um, I tell you what it is, really. I think they are deeply intellectual as a people, philosophical. They study it more for a start. It's much, much more on their curriculum when they're younger than in this country. Um, there is a greater, I think, admiration for intellect in France, for thought and thinking. So a discussion around a dinner table in France um, I'm, I'm lost very often, not just because of the uh, language. That always foxes me after a bit because I find it very difficult to keep up with French because they deliberately speak so fast when you're trying to listen to them. 
but it's not not just that they are into <laughs> ideas you know they're not they're not so much into storytelling to be honest with you i think if we have a talent in terms of words in on this island i think it is storytelling um we 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 tell a pretty good yarn a pretty good lie we're very good at that sort of stuff um i think the french think harder about their stories and if ever a story um reflects that it, it it's this one i think as i mentioned it, it it's a rattling good yarn you can just read it as a yarn and it's it's fun it's also brief that's another thing which is really important really um that they uh, have, have the ability to write very intensely the french i think more so than we have i think we give ourselves more room more pages and anyway in this book it's all done very very intensely and i i love that focus and whenever i've read it to children um because it is complex it is difficult but they're never bored because they sort of go with it and it is child centered it's massively about um how children are um just misunderstood this whole business about asking questions which goes on right the way through the book um which i think many many children i think less so now but when i was growing up you really weren't supposed to ask questions it was just very boring to the adult world around you now i think adult that the adult world is still for us for for children um it can be very tedious i mean i watch my grandchildren sitting at the dinner table listening to us witter on and you just know they want to go you know finish up their ice cream and get out of there um we don't dwell in their world and we don't um seem to know where they want to go with their questions uh and there there is this gulf fix and we it's reflected in our education system i think and particularly i think the french do that i shouldn't say that i think they do it even more they do talk at children quite a lot in schools um and we do that rather too much as well i think we're sort of going that way i don't know that's what i feel i feel they are very very different from us i love their spontaneity um i love the fact that they they like touching um i mean and whether it's because we're on this island and we got a long stretch of water to reach across but we're just not used to touching we're growing into it growing into it. we hug much more and now we got this rich thing that we can't hug i had my grandchildren come for the first time just yesterday everyone had done all they should do and he walked up and he looked at his mum and his dad and and i could see the look in his eyes with what uh, am i supposed to hug him because he'd been told constantly not to hug anything or anyone um but it's fine and i was such a relief to hug because we have learned that from the french from the europeans we've learned to hug you know it's one of the well, i suppose now we're practicing we've got to unhug i don't know how you unhug we're working on that <laughs> um it's a conscious uncoupling i believe as uh, gwyneth paltro <laughs> once described it um kristen as someone who has been a conduit for telling stories um in france and here what about michael's thoughts on that about a country that look steeper into ideas for the french and us who perhaps are better at stories but less adept at ideas what do you think of that i think i think they're not afraid of the abstract um in their storytelling and they can they can keep an idea afloat and sort of play with it and bounce it from one one side to the other without necessarily having up having to come up with a with a with a conclusion um and i think that that uh that i found that um in 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 scripts and plays um it's just that they are quite they they're able to talk about um feelings um le sentiment l'impression the impression the 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 sensations um and they do that a lot in in the the stories that i've told anyway um we've got questions coming in kristen this one is for you why did you decide to take part in this week of live readings for a number of reasons i've i've got a yearn i've been in lockdown in um rural england and i've got a sort of yearning for france um and i thought this was a a, a good way to kind of get a quick sh- shot a dose <laughs> <laughs> Well, you've certainly done that alongside Michael Mopogo and the Duke of Wellington no less. Yes. Um another question for you is what is it about the book that inspires you the most? Gosh, there are so many different parts when you read it um at various stages in your life. You'll read it, you'll find different things sort of leap out of the page at you. Um 
today uh, it is the um the idea of which which island is it it's the not the shopkeeper island um when you go to the you michael you know about this um you could you could describe it better when he goes to the the shopkeeper and he gives him pills so they're never thirsty yeah 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 and then you and you save time because you're never thirsty so you don't have to drink but actually how wonderful it would be to 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 have that time so you could go and drink from a well um and i think that at the moment during this confinement or um or quarantine or whatever we're living through at the moment which is just we're trying to get out of it now we're all desperate to do the most ordinary things the things that we took completely for granted um and i think that that to you know reading that at the moment today um you know made me made me really appreciate that particular section of the book that chapter um the duke of wellington i'd like to ask you a question your grace uh, if i may and that is um do you think you have the balance of your own life right between the boa constrictor and the golf bridge politics and ties <laughs> oh my goodness what a what a profound and difficult <laughs> question to answer. Uh, but uh, of course there is something if there is anything good out of this dreadful period of confinement we all and those of us who are lucky enough uh, and who live perhaps in the countryside to we walk more in the countryside we appreciate nature more than we have done ever before i imagine we hear bird song more than we've ever heard before and all those things i think do make one realize um how lucky we are to live on this planet uh with all the wonderful wonderful uh panoply of activities and objects that nature provides for us to admire and even the, the the sunsets and the yesterday evening we were looking at a rainbow and what miraculous things these are and i just feel that's all part of um what we try to absorb in childhood uh and as adults don't normally appreciate as much as we should good point and that that leads me on very nicely to that question Uh, of of the inner child in you and the last time you felt Kristen you connected with that just the other week uh, my wife and I and our two kids and our dog we went for a walk and we came across a swing in a wood and I clumsily and much to the hilarity of my children got on that swing and it felt amazing to be on that i wonder when was the last time you managed to unlock that inner child and perhaps it's always there i'm making assumptions that perhaps you're always living in the life of the boa constrictor not of the politics golf bridge and ties i th- well I, i i i'm not much in the world of the politics golf bridge and ties i have to say but and and i think um the nature of my profession um is you know we we have to sort of maintain the inner child and and keep um keep some sort of tension between reality and and this this playfulness and um willingness to explore to push to push boundaries to do things that perhaps aren't wise um i do quite a lot of things that aren't wise <laughs> <laughs> well there's a quote for today's uh, part of uh, they will look for a list of that on your wikipedia page things christian <laughs> thomas done that has not been wise over the years michael and you and you're in a child you uh, have this amazing gift to be able to really inspire children's imaginations but what about the inner child yourself well i i think i was quite an inventive quite a sensitive uh, child and i loved for instance i loved acting and i remember very very well the first play i was ever in and um becoming i had to become an owl this is because we were acting the owl and the pussycat by edward lear and um i had stood up in class and um because my mum used to read this to me i knew it already by heart and so i could stand up and recite it the teacher was very impressed and gave me the main part in the school play a christmas play and i remember it so well because i had a costume which was sort of very very feathery and i had a sort of beak mask and i had to sing a song with a kind of guitar and the teacher was playing on a piano i just remember completely accepting being owl you know it wasn't an effort for me at all i was simply owl 
Um, it helped that the girl playing the pussycat I was in love with, I do remember that. Um, so it was sort of a moment in a rowing boat on a stage in front of 150 parents in a school hall in West London. But I lost myself completely in it. And I was that kind of a child. It was slightly wrecked for me, I think, by my mother was an actor as well, um, and a rada and stuff, and she, my daddy too. And I would have been and should have been, I think, an actor. And I lost the heart of it because I went to school where stories were kind of not used anymore for wonder. They weren't used to take you to other places. Um, they were used to teach you. So you were endlessly doing spelling lessons and comprehension lessons. And I was sort of put off it. And I stepped back from that world of, uh, of childhood, I think, really quite early, at about the age of nine or ten, um, and played sport a lot. And um, it was only when I was back in a classroom teaching uh, in my mid-twenties that I rediscovered the power of story again and the power of being a child again, which means you can go anywhere and do anything in your mind's eye. Um, and I felt as I was telling my stories or reading my stories, and I did both, that I could take them with me and we were on as children all together because that's what we are. You know, I say to my interaction, we're just, we are grown up children. And there is a thing, I think we're kind of inculcated with this notion very early on that you have to abandon childhood to become a proper adult. I mean, that quote from the Bible, you know, to put away childish things, it, it, it's sort of not accidental because I think for childish, they, they really mean foolish. Well, foolish is all right from time to time and childish is all right from time to time. So I, I suppose I've grown back into my, I'm now 76, and I've grown back into my, my third or fourth childhood, and um, I have great-grandchild as well. So I've, I've got children, having children around you is important. That's really important. And I've been very lucky because I've worked with children all my life. And you, you begin to see the world through their eyes for the first time, fresh, new, different, and exciting. And that you must never lose. You must never grow this sort of thick skin on you. And I think it's what interesting, Christian was talking about being a, uh, an uh, actor herself and this you you could not have an actor and have a thick skin it, it wouldn't work you know yeah, because yeah. you keep yourself vulnerable to the world and you're giving yourself to the world every single night of your life when you're acting like that and you're becoming other people well children do this almost instinctively so you're just becoming a child again as storytellers or as actors and i wish i'd become an actor really you know I, 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 I feel I, Michael's angling for some work, Kristin, when we come out of lockdown. So if there are any, no, I, I any scripts Robert, that you I, want to send to Michael. I've got to be Robert Redford, no question. <laughs> no question, no question. Um, Kristen, did you grow up with stories whirling around you? Um, I, I, we, we, ha we had a lot of um, books and stories, and stories of my, well, it was... A, in those days, I think we probably still do, but um, my grandparents used to tell me a lot of stories about when they were growing up. And that was the thing, was to hear the stories of wait, when their great grandfather rode across the countryside and did this, or um, when so-and-so discovered a hole and dug down deep and discovered gold at the bottom or whatever, you know, the, whatever stories there were. Some of them it, grossly exaggerated. Uh, and fantastic um, <laughs> off races, getting chased by, I remember a wonderful story of my grandmother, which we'd get her to tell her, uh, tell us over and over again of how, how she'd been chased by an ostrich on the farm. And um, this is all in, in Africa. And, um, and all these, all these sort of, these one, these really great stories of when they were all growing up in a completely different world, um, which was so exciting to us, you know, coming from a little tiny village and, in, in Dorset. Um, Your Grace, were you made very much aware as a child of, of the stories of your ancestors, of which, of course, there are many, many stories. What other stories do you remember of your childhood? Oh, we need to unmute his Grace. We need to unmute him. Give me. There Give we me go. The, I forgot to unmute. There you go. Um, grandfather, uh, reading to me, uh, a book, I think it was called Strule Peter, and the most yeah. terrible stories, Johnny Head in Air, and uh, somebody with very long fingernails, I can't quite read, wonderful stories, and rather frightening for a child. And it was, my grandfather got great pleasure in reading these stories to me and, and getting me worried. 
and then my parents <laughs> complained because I didn't sleep well that evening. <laughs> so uh, um, that's one of the things I remember of my own childhood. But of course, terribly important for one's imagination to have stories like that read to one. Mm. Was that the one with Harriet and the matches? I think that was one of them. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm unaware of these stories. They sound trauma inducing, it has to be said, Your Grace. I, I might avoid them for my own children. <laughs> I, might, I might do that. Uh, there are so many questions coming in. Um, Kristen, which one is your favourite planet that the Little Prince visits? Ah, yes. Well, that is a difficult one because um, I think his planet sounds the best, I have to say, even though it's very small and he has to leave because he needs to, to move on and find his own life and find another rose, um, another flower. Um, yeah, I like the idea of having a little volcano that I have to rake. One of three, of course. Yeah, one of three. One and of and three. With, with, with you never know, may, you know, come burst into life. I, I, I quite like the hope on that one. Does that say something about your own inner volcano, perhaps? <laughs> it's um, my vegetable patch, anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, Michael, do you think the prince is an activist like Greta? That's the question that's coming. Um, well, I suppose in a way he is, but it's not. It's it's sort of not deliberate. I mean, everything he he does really and says is is really about finding out, um, and I think we learn from it. But I don't think um, he he doesn't preach at us. They talk. They have conversations. These two, um, and I think. At the end of the day, it's his example of uh, tenderness, which is the most important thing, and the res respect, I think, um, for other creatures. I mean, it, it really is a book that is absolutely about today. I mean, the Rose thing, the, the Rose story is really interesting because, in a way, one of the great problems that we have is that we've lost the notion. I mean, I think Kristen just mentioned a vegetable garden, when you grow your own leeks, you value them more, you look after them, you value the taste of them more. It, it's coming down to, to something very, very elemental. And it's also that is so with time as well. So really part of what the story is about is not rushing. As a poet said, it's about standing and staring. Um, yes, finding out. Yes, asking questions. Um, but I don't find it a book that spends its time proselytizing, you know? It, it, you, you take what you want from it. You are offered these things by saint Exupéry and the Little Prince. It's a, it's a gentle kind of persuasion. Um, so I, I wouldn't say it's quite the same. I don't think you'd find him standing up and, uh, in front of the um, United Nations and giving a, a, a speech, um, mm -hmm. as a wonderful Swedish girl did. But they, he'd be saying roughly the same sort of things, you know? Stop rushing around like mad things. Think a bit, stand and stare, and look after the world about you. Look after your rose. It's really, really connected. And when was this written? In the 1940s, for goodness sakes. Um, when you would have thought, wouldn't you, historically, they wouldn't have had any um, problem with the environment. But it's not that. It's about tenderness. It's about love, mm. about a connection to the world around us. And um, yes, he teaches us that. Actually, saint Exupéry teaches us that, I think, from the text. But again, gently. You take it or you leave it. No one's thrusting it down your throat. Some more questions. Uh, Michael, this one for you again. Were you intimidated to write a new translation of such a classic French book? Yes, very. I mean, it's um, you, you really uh, take it on. You know people are uh, waiting out there with bear traps, really. Um, and it's not just about the translation. It's about the tone that, that you take. Um, yeah, you, it, it's a much, much loved book. Uh, and at your peril, um, do you kind of change the tone at all? I mean, I've just done something which is not comparable, but it's not far away. I've just been telling the tales of Shakespeare again. I've been spending my lockdown lost in Shakespeare. It's been extraordinary. So I've, I've been writing all these plays in the, same, <coughs> in the same way as Charles Lamb and his sister did, but in a language which children of today can understand in, in order to encourage them to go to the theatre and watch the proper play. Don't get me wrong, it's not instead of. 
and neither is it patronizing. But I suppose you do, you do take your life in your own hands as a writer if you do that sort of thing, because you are bound. You are bound to um, get something wrong in the text, which, which hurts people. A lot of people really love, love, love this text. So you must be very, very careful where you tread. And it's the same thing with Shakespeare. Who do you, what do you do in a 6,000 word story? Um, what do you do with Malvolio and Twelfth Night? It, it, you, at some point you have to uh, trim his garters a bit. You cannot leave him center stage the whole time as you've got no room for the whole story. It's very, very hard, but you know there are people waiting for you who adore Malvolio and want the garters, um, how shall I say, fully there. Um, but you've got to be careful because people love these things. That's the, the truth of it. And you've got to be careful you don't hurt people. But there's adv advice for that in, your, in, in, in The Little Prince. When he says, um, in, when he goes to the, the, the chapter with the, with the, with the, with the man um, who's so conceited. Oh, yeah. When the business man. Yes. No, the conceited man. The, no, the conceited the, one, yeah. yeah I, I want you to tell me just how much you admire me, said the man. What yes. exactly do you mean by admire, asked the little prince. To admire me, replied the man, means to recognise that I am the most handsome man on the planet, <laughs> the best dressed, the wealthiest, and the most intelligent. But you are the only man on this planet. <laughs> <laughs> so it's wonderful. We can't always be the best, you know. We, no, can, just do, we can just do what comes from the heart and do our... Yeah. Uh, utmost to 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 what well, you're talking about doing a translation. I'm talking about um, doing an interpretation of somebody else's writing um, and playing a role, or um, trying to interpret, uh, trying to um, to 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 tell the story of somebody who actually lived. I mean, that's even more um, dangerous than just doing a. An, a, a, a regular role, invented character, but playing playing somebody who's actually lived, that's absolutely yeah. terrifying. But you don't have to be the best. You can just be your best. Yeah. Do it the best you can. Exactly. Kristen, another question. Why do you think this book keeps resonating so much over different generations? I think it's because of what we've just been talking about, about the, the things that you realise as you get older, are more or less important. Um, uh, the, the planet I mentioned earlier, the shopkeeper's planet, or the lamplighter who just keeps having to go up and down and without thinking and, and without trying to work it out, the sort of relentlessness of things. Um, the businessman was terrifying. Um, yeah, well, I think... And I think probably as children, we have, we listen to it in a different way. Um, and Michael, you were talking about la tendresse, the, the, the affection, the love, the, the generosity in it. Um, and I think that that will appeal to all ages. Um, so I, I don't, I mean, there's, the, there's something in it. There's something for everyone. You know, it's all very... Uh, it, it, it's but also very. But it's the poetry as well, which is very, very, which becomes ah. more and more appealing as you get older. I think. Yeah. Mm. It's, also done with, it's also done with great humour. Yeah. Um, you know the, uh, the the wonderful moment where he, he he's told by the rose that actually there's some protection needed from the wind, and um, so there's a cloche coming. It, it, all that is very very tender, but then in the end, um, it's sort of throw me a bit. I don't really need it, but I just. It, I love the the way that the rose takes on a character which uh, has great vanity, um, but is also very loving towards him and likes the way that she loves the way she's been looked after and is going to miss him. But then there's a throwaway line, so it would go if you want, hurry. That's all. I love that. It, it's, um, and he worked, he worked, well, I know he did. This, this book was um, two thirds again longer than it is when he wrote it. He just cut it back and cut it back and cut it back. It's a beautifully trimmed book. Um, you, you know, there's not a a word out of place, and um, right. you never, never feel it goes on too long. In fact, some of the chapters you think, oh, for goodness sake, you turn the page, the chapter's over. Um, but that's, he, he says all that needs to be said and says it simply. And do you know what I love about it? I love the fact that whoever is speaking is looking you in the eye. And I know it's sent exuberly all the time, but it's a very honest book, I think, um, deeply honest. And that's one of the, I think it holds you because someone is speaking truth to you. And we're not used to that that much. Um, Your Grace, um, 
Kristen mentioned the lamplighter. And with the lamplighter, he starts off by having to light the lamp twice a day. And as the world gets faster and faster and faster, he's now having to do it every minute. Um, do you think that after the lockdown is eased, that we will begin to appreciate a slower pace of life? Or do you think that our default will just go back to that speed of life that we were living that's before? Such that's such an interesting point. And I don't think any of us yet fully understand how life will be a year or two years from now. But I do think the fact that so many people have been able to work from home, that almost certainly involves less stress in their life because other than the difficulties of technology, which I experienced myself today. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, other than that, uh, working from home probably is less stressful in many ways than having to commute and travel and on um, public transport and different methods of transport. So uh, there is something rather more calming about our current way of life. And I think there will be many who will wish to preserve that and continue it. So um, there may be something good coming out of all of this, providing we can get the economy moving again. Because at the end of the day, if we don't get the economy moving, then we can't pay for public services and we can't do everything that we want to do in terms of health and education. Uh, I'm very pleased that the government has announced today further expenditure on schools, long overdue, absolutely necessary in the current uh, circumstances. And surely we have all learned again out of this period how incredibly important it is to teach children, particularly, funnily enough, children in primary schools. It seems to me that they're the ones who probably suffered more from lockdown than uh, children in secondary schools. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and that is, I think, very part, of, and I've been so fortunate to listen to this discussion between uh, our two uh, principal guests, um, because I hope it will encourage people to read this book and be as enchanted by it as I and so many others have been. Kristen, what are you missing more, the stage or the set? Oh, that's a terrible question. <laughs> Who do I miss more, my mother or my father? <laughs> it's a difficult question. I specialise in them. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Um, because you can't do either. You can't work at home. No, I, well, okay. no, I, I can't. I, I think... I think I, I have managed to, we, we did, we've just done Talking Heads. We did oh, talk, yes, you did. I did talking heads. We didn't film it from home, but I rehearsed it yes. from home, um, rather like we're doing today, you know, every afternoon. Um, but of course, if there's no live audience, I, it would be no good rehearsing. The other day I went um, to an open garden thing and they it was supposed to be an, an opera, but they had to cancel the opera, obviously, because they had to close the opera house. But they had little they had little corners where oh, four singers were singing and the difference in listening to somebody standing there a few meters away singing for real um compared with what we try to do what we try to replace with um you know live streaming and things like that but just having somebody real in front of you is is just irreplaceable really so I think I'd have to stay the stage. Good, good. There you go. I'll, I promise no more difficult questions. No, it was a beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Firstly, to Alice Mazzilli. Can we see Alice's calligraphy that she has done here? It's absolutely beautiful. Oh yeah. It's whether you can, whether you see the boa constrictor and the elephant or the hat. Thank you, Alice. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. That's it uh, for today. Thank you very much. Uh, for joining us. Thank you to Mont Blanc. Uh, thank you to the uh, Fondation Saint-Exupéry. And of course, thank you to the Institut Francais and the uh, French Embassy for today. And uh, Your Grace, the Duke of Wellington, thank you for joining us today. I hope you, I hope you go and embrace the boa constrictors of life more <laughs> from this point on. Thank you. I've much enjoyed being part of this. Thank you. Uh, and Michael, we shall catch up again tomorrow. 
be well. And I would like to say thank you. Can I say thank you to our you can. fellow guests? Um, because it's been wonderful talking with them and listening to them. Um, but also we we'll kind of need to say thank you to this guy called Saint Exupéry. We must not forget Saint Exupéry as well. Kristen Scott Thomas, thank you so much. Thank for you for having me. There. What an absolute pleasure to hear you read from uh, the Little Prince. Right, that's it from us today. Make sure you join us tomorrow from 5 p.m. And uh, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, we are not trying to hide this from you. We want you very much to be part of this and ask questions. And I shall put our guests tomorrow on the spot. So join us tomorrow from 5. <laughs>